on the front of the building. It says freedom. I'm going to testify a little bit here. I feel some in the room right now. You may not understand it, but I know exactly what's happening. I've seen heroin addicts come on, come to church one way and never do drugs again. I've seen cocaine addicts come to the house of God and never do drugs again. It was 20 years ago. I was praying, seeking God, and I had an encounter with God. He spoke to me, he spoke to me two times this way. The first time was right after I got saved. I was still using drugs every day. I didn't know you, couldn't, you weren't supposed to get high every day, so I smoked meth every day. I didn't know, I thought it was okay. Finally, my mom said, Mijo, you got to change. Because I told my mom, my mom, I want that feeling back, that happiness. She's like, she busted Carlos Santana on me. She's like, Mijo, you got to change your evil ways. I said, oh, man, okay, I got it. I get it. So I, I was going to check into a rehab that day, Christian home. And it was in my room, and I was smoking meth. I smoked meth every day, so it wasn't like the meth was doing it. And all of a sudden, I heard in the corner of my room, as loud as and clear as you could hear, I heard this, Mijo enough is enough and I heard it and I started crying and I heard it again and again loud over and over again and that was the last day I smoked meth and it's been 30 years I'm some of you want to play religion, but some of you are addicted to pornography. You're addicted to pills. You're addicted to all these, all this pharmacia. You're addicted to alcohol, and you're secretly addicted, and some of you are functioning, but this is God to you telling you, I've come and I brought you to set you entirely free. Come on, give them praise. Give them praise. And then 20 years ago, it happened to me again. I had another encounter with God. But this time it wasn't for me, because I was already free. The last thing in my mind was to pastor a church. It's the furthest thing from my mind. And God spoke to me. He said, I need you. I want you. I'm asking you. I've heard the cries of the people. And I'm going to send you to the Pharaoh of Whittier to tell the Pharaoh of Whittier to let my people go. And that moment I said, okay, God. And I started the church with five, six, seven people at the Bluebird Art Lounge about a block from here. And look what God has done. But I want you to know, this is not a regular church. We didn't decide to have a church. God put us here for you because some of you have been crying out you're hurting, you're addicted, you're broken, and you need a savior. And God has brought you here today to tell you and to testify that if he did it for me and he did it for thousands, he's going to do it for you too. Some of you have no hope. You're like, but I, I tried this program and I tried that program and I can't get better. Yes, but have you tried the power of God? Hey, have you tried a lifestyle of freedom? Have you tried the anointing? Somebody give God praise. I'm ministering right now. I'm ministering. Number five. Number five. He's with us. Say, He's with us. As our everlasting Father. Hashtag. Tell your neighbor, best dad ever. Wrong neighbor. Turn to the other neighbor. Say, He's the best dad ever. On the cross, I read something. It's powerful where Jesus is on the cross and He cries out, Eli, Eli, sam, Lama Samatanichi. And it means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you read that and you say, what does that even mean? At that moment, Jesus was taking your sin. And he was taking my sin. Before that, he had no sin. 
The only thing that separates us from God is our sin. So he had no sin. He had never sinned. And because he'd never sinned, him and God were always together. He was God's son and is, and he had his papa, his daddy, best dad ever. He'd never known what it was like to be betrayed. He never knew what it felt like to have a father walk out on you. Or even worse, like many of us, not only walk out but abuse us. He'd never known an absentee father. A father that neglected him or rejected him or was working so much, never paid attention to him. He never knew what that was like. Him and his father were always together. He wouldn't even do anything unless the father told him to do it. But in that moment, in time, on the cross of Calvary, when he was taking your sin and my sin, when he was dying for you and dying for me, at that moment, the scripture says that God looked at his son in sin and had to turn his back. Because he realized this is the moment he's paying the price for Jason's sin and for your sin. And then he died and he rose from the dead. No more sin. He sent that sin back to hell where it came from. And then him and the Father were restored. But the beautiful thing now is if I call on Jesus and, I walk, and, I, and he comes into my heart and into my life, the same relationship Jesus has with his Father he now made a way so I can have that same relationship with his father. So his father is my father. Come on, somebody. Our father. I said, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. How many thank God he's your daddy now. He's your papa. Say, why is that important? For so many reasons. So many reasons. One of the things fathers give you identity. My father decided when he was a little boy, Christmas time is very emotional for me because that's when my dad left. Dropped me off one weekend at my mom's house and never came back. Something broke in me. My stepdad, I turned to him to raise me. He abused me every day. So my fathers were supposed to give me an identity. So they were left. They left me. So I had to get my identity from my, the neighborhood, from my friends. They don't even know who they are. They don't have any dads either. So we're blind boys leading the blind. Don't judge people because they're messed up. If you don't have no father in your life, who's going to tell you who you are? And if you don't know who you are, then the world will tell you. You're this, you're that. You're, they'll put a label on you. But you know what I've had to learn to do? Every label the world put on me, I take it off and I put the label that God says I am. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're a child of God. You're a new creation. You're more than a conqueror. You're blessed coming in and you're blessed going out. You're anointed. You're appointed. You're chosen. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You're healed. You're set free. And you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. How many know we need God to give us an identity? You're a child of God now. You're not an orphan. You're not abandoned. You have a father now. And the Bible says, don't worry about tomorrow. What you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what you're going to drink, don't worry about it. Just seek the Father's kingdom. And Father says, I'm going to take care of it. Some of you are full of anxiety over Christmas and all stressed out. Listen, the greatest gift you can give your family, come on somebody, it's not a present. The greatest gift you can give your children is teach them that they have a Father in heaven and He'll take care of them. Somebody give God one more praise. Everybody stand on your feet, please. Everybody stand on your feet all over the auditorium. We're going to pray now. He's also with us as the Prince of Peace. Some of you just need to take a deep breath in the presence of God. You're carrying a lot right now. Some of you are about to break down under the pressure. And God says, Mijo, mijo, give me the worry. Give me the burden. Give me the bills. I'll help you. I'll give you the wisdom. I'll provide. I'll give you the job. I'll give you what you need to take care of it. What about my child? What about my marriage? What about... God says, come on, I'll be your counselor. I'll be your deliverer. I'll be your mighty God. I'll be your, your father. I'll give you my peace. And then the last thing here, and I want to close. Number seven. He was with us as God's precious son. And he was born to die. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish. But they would have everlasting life.
I read this scripture, and I'm going to close with this. In the book of Revelation, John was in heaven. God allowed him to see heaven. And John said, I, I saw and I, and I heard the voice of many angels. The numbering were thousands upon thousands. And 10,000 times 10,000. It was innumerous. You couldn't count how many angels there were. And they were all around the throne. And these living, powerful, amazing, beautiful creatures that God created. They're in heaven right now. And the 24 elders. And in a loud voice, they were all saying, a loud voice. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. That's Jesus right now being worshipped. How many know he's worthy of it all? I'm going to say two things that we're going to pray. The first thing I want to say is, you may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be. You may not have everything perfect in your home. You might not have the best tree. You might not have a lot of presents under your tree. But you have the greatest gift that anyone could ever have or give away. You got the gift that keeps on giving. And no matter what you're going through, don't let the devil steal your joy. He is worthy of it all. And right now, if you could hear in heaven, they're singing this song, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Can we take about a minute and close your eyes and forget about who's next to us? And for a moment, you want to lift your hands and lift your hands and worship God and tell Him thank you for keeping you alive. this Christmas. Thank Him. Come on and thank Him. Tell Him you deserve. Have a moment. The angels are crying out this right now. The angels worship, the elders worship, the living creatures worship, your family that's gone on, your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, your children that have gone on right now. They're worshiping him right now. He's worthy of it all. You huh. are worthy of it all. You know, I'm going to say something that's going to encourage somebody. For you that have lost loved ones, and the season comes around, don't allow a spirit of depression to come on your life. The Bible says when you sorrow as a Christian, you have sorrow, you're human, you'll cry, but you don't cry with no hope. Because you may not have your loved ones in the flesh, and it may have been goodbye, but it's also, I'll see you later. Oh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this thing today in Jesus' name. Some of you have ones that went on already, and this time the devil makes you feel so sad and depressed. You need to, you could cry like normally, you miss them in the flesh, but understand you're going to see them again. And you know what your loved one's doing right now? They're worshiping like this. And they're saying, worthy, 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 
worthy is the Lamb of God. And you know what? One day, you're going to see them again, and you're going to worship with Him again. But don't wait to worship, for the Bible says that those that have gone on are in a grandstand, and they look at you, and they look at me, and you know what they're saying? You know what they're saying? Run the race, behold. Run the race, behold. Run. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't bow down. Don't back down. He's worthy, church. He's worthy. I got to close. And I'm going to pray. Many years ago, I had a, my grandma Kuka. My grandma Kuka came from Mexico. She was an immigrant. So she, got, she came in on the bottom of a train. She was brought in illegally. And we don't really know how old my grandma was. We think around 100 and something, 107 maybe, because she didn't have a birth certificate. And she was like, little lady, she got smaller every year. Kuka, Grandma Kuka. I love my grandma. And we had no pictures of her childhood or nothing like that because she never was... Uh, she never had that. That was from back in Mexico. And then my grandma went home to be with the Lord, and it was during the funeral. And I wasn't even a Christian yet, but God is good. And I had a dream of my grandma. And I saw her so beautiful. Her hair was black. Remember, my mom, grandma was a hundred and something, so her hair was like real thin. And her teeth, you know, they were they left a long time ago. Come on, somebody. She put her teeth like that. She scared me as a kid, you know. And I saw this gorgeous, beautiful woman in her 20s. And she was dancing with her hair in heaven. In the presence of God. And then one of, one of the family members came from Mexico and they brought all these pictures. And they put them on my grandma's table and they were showing everybody. And I went and I looked and when I saw that picture, it was like the hair stood up on my back. And I went, that's what I saw. Heaven is a real place. It's not a figment of the imagination. It's a place. And your loved ones are there. My grandma Kuka's there, Goyle's there. Those that I've lost are there and your loved ones are there. Church, this life is temporary. Serve God, give God your heart, give God your life, live for God. This life is here today and it's gone tomorrow. Today, 